But there were some performance cars that automakers built that weren't by definition true muscle cars, but instead carried on their spirit, and even included good handling characteristics, as well as some pep under the hood. In this video, we take a look at performance cars from the 1980s that you might have forgotten about, or maybe didn't even know existed. These are in no particular order, so let's spend a few minutes going back to the automotive world of the 1980s to see what that decade had to offer. This car traces its lineage back to 1968 when the Hearst Olds option was first made available on the Cutlass as a collaboration between Oldsmobile and the Hearst Company. Over the years, the Hearst Olds option appeared on the Cutlass for the 1968 through 1969, 1972 through 1975, and 1979 model years. In 1983 and 1984, the Hearst Olds returned again for the Cutlass with the unmistakable Hearst graphics applied to the outside, a slightly hotter 307-inch 180 horsepower V8 engine, and the tricked-out lightning rod floor shifter. There were 6,501 of the Hearst Olds produced over the two-model year period and marked the end of the collaboration between the two companies. These are a unique and fun car to drive and are becoming scarcer as time goes by, with their resale values increasing steadily over the years. This is the only front-wheel drive car we cover in this video, but it's a special one. In the early 1980s, the CEO of Chrysler Corporation, Lee Iacocca, enticed the legendary Carroll Shelby out of retirement by offering him the opportunity to breathe his performance magic into Dodge vehicles as he had done 20 years earlier with the 1960s era Ford Mustangs. From the partnership, Dodge created the Shelby Charger and the Omni GLH. The GLH stood for Goes Like Hell, which it did with its 2.2 liter four-cylinder turbocharged engine, putting out 146 horsepower in the 2100 pound car that handled pretty good as well. For 1986, an even higher performance version of the Omni GLH was offered that they named the GLHS for Goes Like Hell some more. This variant, of which only 500 were built, had an upgraded turbo engine that put out 175 horsepower and was paired with a 5-speed manual transmission. These are neat cars and a blast to drive, and they're kind of rare. Their value is increasing, and they might be something to consider putting in your garage as a 1980s turbo car investment. Personal luxury cars were popular in the 1970s and early 1980s, and Chevrolet's Monte Carlo was a top seller during that period. But what if you wanted something that was less floaty boaty refined, and more Saturday night heavy metal? Chevrolet had you covered with their Monte Carlo SS. This version of the Monte did away with the wire wheel covers and faux wood interior trim with a more athletic aesthetic. The SS came with a new front fascia, rear spoiler, cool alloy wheels, and a beefed up suspension to go along with the 180 horsepower 305 cubic inch V8. It looked like it could go racing and its performance wasn't completely terrible. Chevrolet even released a special edition NASCAR inspired Aero Coupe version in 1988. The Monte Carlo SS is a cool looking 80s retro ride and are starting to see their values rise and we think this will be a sought after future collector car. The Mustang tried on a few different hats in the 1980s to appeal to as wide a range of buyers as possible. During that time, cars with turbocharged engines were the new hotness and each domestic automaker had something to offer. Ford ushered in a rejuvenated performance era with the Mustang 5.0, but also offered a different take on Mustang performance with the SVO. This was the Mustang with the performance turbocharged four-cylinder engine, essentially the same 2.3 liter 200 horsepower engine that was used in the Thunderbird Turbo Coupe. The SVO could handle the curves well and was just as quick as the 5 liter Mustang. Mustang SVOs are easy to spot because of the aero style headlights, offset hood bulge, biplane rear spoiler and unique wheels. Ford made only 9,835 SVOs, making them somewhat rare and potentially very desirable in the future, judging by their appreciating value these days. They're also an entertaining car to blister through the corners when you want to relive the exciting retro turbo 80s. 1984 was the year that the Toyota MR2 and the Pontiac Fiero mid-engine two-seat sports cars were debuted to the world. 
One was quick and handled well, and the other was a poorly engineered rough handling slug that couldn't get out of its own way. Sadly, that would be the Fiero. After an initial sales success, people caught on to what this car wasn't, a performance vehicle. That changed in 1985 when the Fiero GT was unveiled that included a 2.8 liter V6 engine rated at 140 horsepower, but did not include suspension and handling upgrades to go along with that new power. That would have to wait until the 1988 model year when an entirely new and improved suspension design finally gave the Fiero the handling chops to go along with its V6 engine. Just when they got it right, GM decided to cancel the Fiero due to slumping sales, even though they had gone through the trouble of creating prototypes for a potential 1990 model year. The 1988 Fiero GT with the WS6 suspension package is the one you want to take on a mid-engine satisfying drive as it represented the pinnacle of the Fiero line where Pontiac had finally sorted the car out to make it what it should have been in the first place before pulling the plug on the program. This next one was the sleeper car of the 1980s. It looked like it was designed with only a ruler and applied the formula of creating a factory muscle car by cramming a performance engine into a rear-wheel drive mid-sized body. That's exactly what Ford did in 1984 when they released the Ford LTD LX with the 5.0 liter V8 from the Mustang beneath its plain Jane hood. The car included some handling upgrades, blacked out trim, sporty cast aluminum wheels, and dual exhaust. Some called it a four-door Mustang at the time. It was an obscure, lightly marketed beast to say the least, with around 3,200 sold over its two-year model run. Even more obscure and rare was its Mercury twin, the Marquee LTS, of which only 134 were made and sold only in Canada. The LTD LX, however, still comes up for sale every now and then, with prices rising due to its rarity and novelty. If you love driving understated forgotten performance cars, this is the one for you. Pontiac produced this NASCAR-inspired Grand Prix variant with quirky styling to satisfy homologation requirements so it could be more competitive with the Ford Thunderbird of the mid-1980s. They called it the 2 Plus 2, and it differentiated from the ordinary Grand Prix styling by including a massive bubble-shaped rear backlight, an aerodynamic front fascia, and a fiberglass shortened trunk lid with an integrated deck spoiler. The changes did help it on the oval speedways by minimizing aero drag and helping to keep the rear end planted in the turns. They made only 1,225 of these over its one model year period, ensuring their rarity and future desirability. As time passes, their resale values are increasing, so maybe an aero pre might be a primo opportunity to score an example of mid-1980s NASCAR-related weirdness. Motor Trend's Car of the Year for 1989 was the newly redesigned Thunderbird's performance version, the Super Coupe. It was Ford's BMW fighter that included rear-wheel drive and independent suspension, the only American car besides the Corvette that offered these at the time. But the secret weapon resided beneath its hood, a 3.8-liter supercharged V6 engine rated at 210 horsepower, and was a blast to drive with its smooth 315 pound-feet of torque coming on at only 2600 RPM to push you back in your seat like muscle cars of the past. Folks are just now recognizing just how special and over-engineered these cars are. So much so that Ford management was unhappy with unit cost overruns at the time caused by the inclusion of the independent rear suspension that motivated its program manager to resign from the company over the issue. A super coupe that's super fun to drive that's seeing resale prices steadily climbing. So if you're thinking of pulling the trigger on getting one, now would be the time. For 1989, Shelby and Dodge were at it again with the creation of the Shelby Dakota, a V8-powered Dodge Dakota pickup truck. This was the highest performing truck you could buy at the time, and along with the Little Red Express truck from 10 years earlier, laid the groundwork for the future performance trucks that would come, including the GMC Cyclone, the Ford Lightning, and the Chevrolet 454 SS. Besides the unique trim and graphics telling the world that this was a Shelby, the truck did away with the stock V6 engine and replaced it with a 175 horsepower 318 cubic inch V8, which was the only way to get the V8 in a Dakota in 1989. 
These neat trucks were quick for their day with 0 to 60 arriving in 8.5 seconds. Not bad for a 3,600 pound truck with a bench seat. As an early progenitor of the coming muscle truck performance genre, the Shelby Dakota is a nifty ride from the late 1980s that would be a sublime addition to any collection. We couldn't resist putting a 1980s performance legend on our list that didn't have a monstrous V8 under its hood, but derived its giddy-up from a bang-on appropriate 1980s power plant. A turbocharged V6 engine. This car had everything going for it. Limited production, stunning good looks and tons of power for its day. Darth Vader himself certainly enjoyed his. We are of course referring to the one year only Buick GNX, a super cool machine derived from the Grand National that was the antithesis to Buick's stodgy grandpa car image. In creating this car, Buick set out to produce the quickest production four-seater ever built at the time. As 1987 was the last year that Buick sold the rear-wheel drive Regal from which the GNX was based upon, they decided to create a Super Grand National as a fitting send-off for its final year. The GNX put out 276 horsepower and was quicker than the 1987 Corvette in both the quarter mile and the 0 to 60 sprint. These cars are a hoot to drive and a challenge to resist the urge to melt the treads off the tires. They're also not cheap these days should one wish to acquire one, but their values are rising quickly and might make a nice alternative to buying an NFT, whatever that is. And those are our nominees for some of the coolest performance cars from the 1980s that have rapidly become or are becoming desirable collector cars. That's it for now. Thanks for taking the time to watch, and please be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel.